So hey, before we begin, just a couple of questions for our kids as I, uh, as I call you up. Uh, the first one is this. Um, I'm going to tell a story in just a few minutes about a fisherman who was a disciple of Jesus. I want you to be thinking of the name of the disciple that I am talking about. And within this story, what did Jesus tell this disciple to do? So the name of the disciple, fishing, and what Jesus told him to do. And then this other question is, who is invited to God's kingdom party? So that's for our kids, and then we will call them up at the end of our time together. This morning, we are just going to spend a few moments uh, kind of giving the bigger picture of this text that Allison just read for us in Luke's Gospel, the sixth chapter. This is often referred to as the Sermon on the Plain, and it's very close to what we find in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, um, for those who study this, there is, um, the question has been, is this just the same teaching recorded in two different ways, or if indeed Jesus taught this on two different occasions? I tend to believe, uh, because Jesus often taught in different places and to different crowds, that this was most likely a summary of what we find in Matthew, because Jesus was consistent with what he was teaching. And so this morning, as we look at this text, the thing I want to undergird our conversation with is for us to consider a question that I believe is central to what we find in this story with Jesus' blessings and woes or uh, warnings that we look at. And that is this. Have any of you here ever been disappointed with something that did not meet your expectation? I saw one hand go up super fast. Um, yeah, most of us. Most of us have things that we have expectations about and we find that the reality of those things don't often meet what our expectations are. So we are disappointed oftentimes. Oftentimes we struggle with doubt and a sense of assurance that God actually sees and hears. I'll put it to you this way. We often teach our kids that honesty is the best policy, that we should always tell the truth. And then when they tell the truth, they find themselves on the wrong side of power. They find themselves, they might find themselves ostracized or ridiculed by their colleagues and classmates. They may find themselves even being furtherly, uh, further shamed and punished even sometimes by well-intentioned parents. I'm guilty of it. But we oftentimes tell people that our integrity, that telling the truth, often yields the best results, but our experiences sometimes suggest otherwise. And so there is a dilemma or a tension that often builds as a result of this. And this is especially true of the spiritual life. How do we understand this promise that God blesses, rewards, or vindicates the faithful? And for us, I believe we should go back to the beginning and understand what was separated in the first place. When God created the heavens and the earth, it's important for us to remember that these two dimensions of God's created world were meant to function and flourish together. And when the first image bearers sinned, that whole project went awry. Man was no longer seen to be in fellowship, abiding in peaceful relationship with God and creation. Instead, man turned inward toward himself. And we have then the birth of idolatry, chaos, and catastrophe. And yet the resolution of what God had intended was that through Christ he would reconnect what had long been lost. And so for us now, it will be important that we take Jesus' words afresh and anew, that we place them in its, their proper context to understand that when he comes to announce the arrival of God's kingdom, he is giving us the meta-narrative or the bigger story that is meant to make sense of all of human history in the past, in the present, and in the future. This passage is particularly tough because Jesus gives us some pretty serious warnings as well. 
And I think one of the difficulties for us as the church in the West is we have often reduced Jesus' sayings and his teachings to cute little truisms that we can place on bumper stickers or that we can put on coffee mugs, t-shirts, and hats. And if you don't believe me, just go to parables. It's all there for us. And I will be the first to tell you that even for us in our family, our home, have those reminders, those kind of, if I'd say, those, those trinkets and those pieces of art that reflect the, the life and the words of Jesus. But these are meant to be taken in the larger scope of the message of this kingdom. What we find here in Luke chapter 6 is Jesus now beginning to call us into this place of community. He is calling for himself a new people of whom faithful obedience will be required. This would be a community who would experience opposition and persecution. And Jesus' preparation of those events is at the heart of what we find within these few verses. It's important for us to remember now that through Jesus, everything in the world was now different. And to get to, uh, to, get to Luke chapter 6, it's important for us to see where we have been. And even though that would take a, at least an hour to go through, I want to touch on briefly a few events for us so that we can see how we get to Luke chapter 6. If you remember, Luke, Luke's gospel is written to a person named Theophilus. And it's this idea now as Luke writes this gospel that he says, Theophilus, I have taken it upon myself to give you an orderly account of all that has been said, of all that has been recorded about Jesus. In fact, Luke says, I am one of many who have taken this endeavor on because I want you to be certain of the things that you have been taught about Jesus. And so here we are. 2,000 years later, and we are a community still, I believe, in need of being reassured of what we have been taught about Jesus. Because oftentimes, we will be given every opportunity to go our own way. We will be given every opportunity to believe a different breath or wind of doctrine that takes us away from Jesus. And yet, the whole charge of Luke to Theophilus, I believe, is a charge and encouragement for us today. We can have confidence and what we have been taught about this one whom we worship each and every day of our lives. Luke's gospel points us to the fact that God's light, his life, was shining now into the world in order to show us a way forward. The, the apostle John would call the light of Jesus the light of the life of men. And much like light that invades a dark room, we too at first glance might shun that light. I am awoken every weekday at 5.30 a.m. by a light because I married an early bird. And every day as I go into my children's room and flip the light on to prepare them for school, their same reaction is the same, to hide from the light. The light that God shines in our hearts through Christ is not meant to push us into further shame or to push us into deeper shadows, but in fact, it is meant to illuminate a way forward, to show us a way of life where forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation can be experienced. And through Jesus now, there is a new way of doing things. We heard a couple of weeks ago with Pastor Kip's sermon, as Jesus reads the scroll in Isaiah, that he was the one anointed, set apart, chosen to bring this good news to the captive, to the poor, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to give the recovery of sight to the blind, and that through Jesus now, this work was being fulfilled. We see Jesus moving through the countryside, uh, performing exorcisms uh, uh, by, a single, uh, by a single word giving life to those who were bound, who were possessed, who were otherwise hopeless and giving them new life. We see Jesus engaging the leper, the untouchable, those of whom were thought to be unclean and outside of God's program. We see Jesus engaging them, loving them, touching them. 
And interestingly enough, we find that Jesus was not defiled by touching them. In fact, Jesus' presence made them whole, gave them life, and gave them a newness of hope that they had otherwise not had before. And so the question for us should always be, who are the oppressed? Who are the marginalized? Who are the lepers of our day? Because that is whom Christ is calling us to as we continue in this work. One of my favorite scenes in all of Scripture it involves a paralytic coming through the roof at a house where Jesus is teaching. There's so many people there that they can't get in. And as this paralytic is lying down before him, Jesus lays down and says, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven to the, to the anger And the disdain and the ire of the religious leaders there because they said, doesn't this teacher know that only God has the ability to forgive sin? And yet in this new thing that God is doing in the world, the breaking the dawn of this new day is the reality that God had put on flesh and come to make available to all of us the life in this kingdom. Jesus tells him to prove that I have the authority to forgive sins. Take up your mat, get up and walk. And there is great rejoicing, but there is great opposition. But it is this new day that's dawning. And I think it is actually best met out in this great scene that we find where Peter, kids, Peter is fishing. He's been fishing all night and he's had no success. And as they're bringing their boats in, Jesus Jesus tells Peter, hey, throw your nets out on the other side one more time. Peter's a fisherman. He knows how, the, he knows how this works. He knows that the best time for catching fish has passed. But Peter, for all of the bad rap that he gets, is a case study in reluctant obedience. Fine, Jesus. Whoosh. And that is to say something for us that sometimes a reluctant obedience is better than no obedience. Sometimes it's difficult to be obedient. Sometimes we hear Jesus telling us to do things, to love people, to enter into hard work, and we just don't want to do it. But Peter still throws the net over, and we know the story. The nets are full. The boat's about to capsize. They need more help. And interestingly enough, Peter, the small businessman whose family's livelihood dependent on the catch of fish, looks at Jesus and he doesn't say, yes, this will bring a great return on the market. Yes, this will, give a, this will make us good for a couple of months. No, Peter's response should clue us into what's going on. It's the same response that Isaiah has when he sees God in his glory in the temple in the, in, in, in the Old Testament where Isaiah says, oh my gosh, I'm ruined. I'm a person of unclean lips and he wants to hide. And the angel comes and touches his lips with coal and and purifies him and cleans him. Peter's the same way. He wants to run and hide because he realizes that he's in the presence of somebody who is ushering in a new day into God's world. So, as we come to this great scene, I want us to imagine that we are there. That we are disciples of Jesus. And we have been privy to all of the events that I just talked about. And that the good news of the kingdom was being made available to everyone and all who were there. Perhaps we would have great anticipation and expectation. That those who would see the miracles, those who would see the exorcism, those who would see the paralytic get up from their mat and walk would experience a change of heart that they too would receive Jesus as their Messiah. And we will see if that is the case and why Jesus, I believe, gives his disciples a clear indication that perhaps their expectations might be met at least initially with some disappointment. So we're going to take a quick pause from the text. And we are going to take a left turn because I like doing that kind of stuff. But how many of you guys remember playing, and and some of you kids, how many of you guys remember playing in the playground during recess? Okay, so this is a question for you. If you were on the playground and there were a group of students and you had two, and I'll just call them alpha students who were considered captains, if they were choosing teams 
and each of them were choosing four other players, so there was five on five, what game would we most likely be playing? Basketball. If they each chose 10 other players, so it was 11 on 11, what game would we be playing? Football or soccer. Football or football. Right? We know this by the number and we know the game and we have a sense of familiarity with how those games work so that when Jesus now calls these 12 to a special place within his ministry, he is hearkening upon a familiar story that the people of God would have been familiar with and that was God's calling of Israel with their 12 tribes to be salt and light in a vocation. And so it would have been a signpost, a reminder that something new was going on. And in touching into this old story, I have no doubt that he would have, dust, he would have touched on a deep, uh, a deep reservoir of remembrance or even nostalgia. Because isn't it easy to look back in the past and think, man, God was, so, God was much more present back then. Remember the old days? When people came to church on Sunday, oh my gosh, man, God was really on the move. Remember when people would actually do this or that? Remember when God parted the Red Sea? Remember when there was a pillar and a fire? Remember when he gave Samson one more strength one more time? Remember when he chose a shepherd boy to slay the Philistine uh, giant? Remember when, and we tend to romanticize and, and give the past so much nostalgia that we think God is completely incapable of doing anything in the present. And yet what Jesus is telling us is that there is this new day coming. In fact, Hebrews would tell us this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'll just throw this out there as a community, and I'm a part of us. If we don't see God moving like we think he moved in the past, it's not him who's moved. And the invitation for us now is to rejoin him in that movement and in that work of the renewal of all things. Because at the end of the day, we do believe that life and not death will have the last word. We believe that our history, human history, has been shaped by a historic event known as the physical resurrection of Jesus, which is a signpost and a promise that all things will eventually be made new. But in the meantime now, as no doubt as disciples, we would have anticipated with great joy and anticipation of all of these things coming to pass. Jesus would have tempered our expectations, but then pointed us to the reality that we would be vindicated if we did not lose heart. He looks at his disciples. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We have access and availability to this kingdom life where God's rule and reign can begin to take shape in our relationships, in our life, in our passion, in our loves, where we can truly allow the Spirit to align us to the purposes of God so that in all that we do, we know that we are living in the abundant resources made available to us by Christ. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And blessed are you, the text that Allison read, be happy when people persecute you and revalue you because of me. Because great is your reward. And great is your reward in heaven. And this idea is not that we are just storing up things that we finally get to enjoy when we die, but we are, anticip we are participating in a rhythm of life that says no matter what comes, we know that Christ and Christ crucified and resurrected and triumphant will always have the last word. And so we can truly expect opposition to this change. Oftentimes, oftentimes in Jesus promises his disciples this, that there will be those who will see what Jesus is doing and they will want someone else to do that work because Jesus doesn't do it the way we want it to. We want him to. 
we can expect rejection. But when we are rejected, will we respond? Will we respond in anger or with faithfulness? The kingdom life is one, indeed, where we have access or reward, but it is one that we are absolutely vindicated. I think the closest example, a popular cultural example that I can give is a number of years old, but do any of you remember the movie The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith about Charles Gardner? Could you raise your hand if you remember? Because I don't, I don't want to spend too much time. Okay, good. So if you remember Will Smith's character is playing Charles Gardner, who was a single dad, who was, who was in a life had been uh, pretty unfair and cruel, and he, he experienced a great deal of, of, of homelessness, but he had a son. And everything about his life was motivated by love for his son. And so he went through the rigors of becoming a stockbroker so that he could find employment and be successful. But my favorite scene in all of that, it's the last day of his internship. He has taken the test, and it's his last day. And as he is working, he is called into the office where he goes to the head of the CEO of the company and other officers. And as he, as he sits down, he makes the comment and he says, I thought I would wear a shirt today because it's the last day. The CEO looks at him and goes, well, we want you to wear a shirt tomorrow because tomorrow is your first day. Would you like that, Chris? And Will Smith, playing Chris Gardner, gets tears in his eyes, and he just said, yes, yes, I would. And the CEO asks him, was it as easy as it looked? He said, no. No, it wasn't. It wasn't easy. But there was something informing him that knew that if he kept after it, he would be vindicated. And for us, as God's people, this life that comes from the cross, to the cross, through the cross, into resurrection, is not easy. But it is worth it. We live in a world that seems to be going exceedingly mad. Scripture tells us to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I have this stubborn optimism brothers and sisters, that because of the resurrection, the present days don't have the final days. We are called to this work of joining Jesus on his mission, which you hear us talk time and time again, of jumping into the water to get dirty, to get messy, to roll up our sleeves and get busy loving people because even though it seems dark and even though it's difficult, I can promise you that there is a deep-seated spiritual hunger that exists for many people in our world and they want to have the light of God shine and illuminate a way for them forward. And we are called to that work. Now, uh, we're going old school. I don't have the notes on here, so I'm just going to give you this if you want to fill this out. Number one, Jesus is never indifferent about our need for grace. If you notice this, even in the midst of all of this, even in the midst of opposition, Jesus is still healing. He's still exercising demons. He's still proclaiming the good news and healing. He is never indifferent about our condition. Secondly, the work of reconciliation will always involve opposition. The work of reconciliation will always involve opposition. Faith is a matter of public importance. While faith is deeply private and personal, it is never meant to just be private and personal. The Christian faith is a public one. We have been given a prophetic voice to speak lovingly, honestly, and truthfully into a world in need of truth and direction. And lastly, the kingdom of God is turning the world right side up. So... With that, um, did I had a picture here? Did where's Galen? Is he gone? He's probably in the back. Hey, where's my picture? Do any of you see a picture? If I could, this is really awkward. Can I have all the kids come up? Oh my gosh! Right there. Thanks, brother. I didn't see that. 
So if I could have the kids come up real quick. Okay. This is going to be a quick lesson because I'm going to send you back for just a few moments to hang out with your parents. So yeah, come around here, come around here. So here are the questions. So who was the disciple in the story who was also a fisherman? What was his name? Peter. It was Peter. Good. And what did Jesus tell Peter to do? Do you remember? Um, cast his nets back out. Cast his net. Good. Cast his nets back out on the other side. And what did he catch a bunch of? A bunch of fish, right. So Jesus came to announce the good news that God's kingdom was finally coming. So here's the idea. Who is invited to this kingdom party? Everyone. Everyone. Everyone say everyone. Everyone. Does that include you guys? Does that include me? And guess what? He chooses all of us to work together. So I want to show you guys a picture. This is a picture of, this is a picture of some of my favorite friends. These are people, it's what? Are you sure it's upside down? (laughs) How did you know it was upside down? Because the people are hanging from the Wait wait a minute, it's upside down and you can still recognize that there's people? So even when things aren't as they're supposed to be, we have an idea of what it should be, right? So you're right, the picture was upside down. But now, it's right side up, Right? This, was a group, this is a group of people who were really important to me. For two years, they met in my house for Bible study and for prayer, and we would take communion together, and it was awesome. But this was a community of people who wanted to join Jesus on this work. And you notice that it was upside down, but now it's right side up. And part of the work that we are called to do is to see a world that's upside down and turn it right side up. And one of the ways we can begin to do that is through prayer. So I want you to guys hurry back and go sit with your families. I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and awesome. You're all faster than I, I was. So with all of that now, we are going to close in just a few moments. But we're going to spend just a couple of minutes doing something that we have not done in here. Uh, we have not done in here uh, since I've been here. In Acts 2.42, there were four things that were central to the life of the people of God. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. The text that we just read today reminds us that even as Jesus was on his mission, he would take time to go into places to pray. So if Jesus takes time to pray, you and I need to take time to pray. And one of the things that we can do, that we can do, as Paul tells us, is to carry one another, as we carry one another's burdens, and to fulfill the law of Christ, is to pray. Now, I will be honest with you, I have a hard time praying for myself. I struggle with that. I often wonder if I'm being selfish, or if I actually think I believe in a God who knows what I need, why should I pray for it anyway? But you know what I don't have a problem with? Praying for other people. Because there is the stubborn optimism that God loves those around me. And sometimes I just, sometimes I think for us, it would be good and important for us to spend just a few moments praying for one another. So here's the good news. No one's going to have to pray out loud. No one will even have to move from their seats. But I want you to take a mental note of who's sitting around you. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ, and each one of them has a need, a place in their lives in which they need God to dramatically intervene for them. Whether you realize it or not, whether everything looks good on the outside or not, we are all poor in spirit, those of us who understand our need for grace. So take a mental note. If it's a spouse, pray for them. You may know all that they're going through, but when was the last time you prayed for your spouse? Kids, pray for your parents. Pray that God would give them grace because Lord knows we need it. 